Did you find, did you find, well, let me just go here. I, I'm not going to talk about Jesus' best friend, John the Apostle. I want to talk about Jesus' half-brother. Joseph the carpenter was not the father of Jesus. God the Father is the father of Jesus. But contrary to Catholic dogma, Joseph and Mary had additional children. Uh, Joseph and Mary didn't become celibate after the birth of Christ. That's a bad marriage teaching. If I had one son, bless God, that's it, buddy, you're shut off. This is a one-child family, sir. <laughs> in fact, in fact, the Bible is very clear. There's, if you'd look this up for yourself later about the brethren of Jesus, there are people who say, well, that's just believers or brethren. Listen, there were no believers known as brethren until after the resurrection. So, and this is, predates the resurrection. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he became the firstborn of the dead and the first begotten of, first begotten of many brethren. I'm quoting you scripture. It's in your Bible. The, so this certainly, back when Jesus was growing up and those half-brothers and sisters would make fun of him and say, hey, Jesus, it's time for Passover. Don't you need to go up to Jerusalem and do your thing? They were constantly scorning him. The Bible indicates they did, made fun of him. His own half-brothers and sisters. But one came away. Let's talk about that one that came away and changed. His name is James. I want to take you to the book of James because you may have heard of some, you, you, you may have heard of Spurgeon. I bet some people don't know who Spurgeon is. You may have heard of John Wesley. You probably did. You may have heard of Ben Franklin. You may have heard of George Washington. You may have heard of Genghis Khan. You may have heard of Billy Graham. You may have heard of Adam. You may have heard of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you didn't know them. You didn't know them. You only know what you, only know what you heard. Is that true? But when you have a chance to read writings of people who knew Jesus, James grew up with him in the family. The Bible says the enemies of man are his own house. Jesus had them. Right in his own home. But when you when you live around someone and you're around them every day as, as John the Apostle was around Jesus, this is a disciple that Jesus loved, and then you got this James guy. When these guys would write, it wasn't just from a distance. They were in relationship. They knew. As, as John said in 1 John chapter 1, I just love what it, how John says this in 1 John chapter 1, not St. John, but 1 John, verse 1. He says, we have handled the word of life. Are you serious? We have handled? That means we have touched him, the living word who came in the flesh, Jesus. We have had dinner with him. We've listened to him teach. We've Held him. He's held us. We know him. We know the word of life. I want to know how these guys think. Now, there may be others that will try to tell you about Jesus, 
based on writings of other men who knew him. But I'm really keen on talking to somebody who was there when he was here. Because I think there's something to be learned in that connection that if you stop and look at it from this angle, these guys that wrote, which is part of your canon, the Bible, wrote not just from revelation, but from face-to-face -face contact in that revelation. I think it's important. You may have theologians tell you what they thought Jesus said. You may have theologians try to reinterpret what they thought he should have said. Or you may have theologians didn't like what he said and change it into something that he didn't say. But when you have an eyewitness account and you have somebody that was there, lived in this and lived with this, I want to know how they think. I want to learn from their experience and the revelation that would come. John, the Apostle John, was the one of the twelve that accurately defined in St. John chapter 1, accurately defined that Jesus existed before he came in the flesh. He accurately said, this is the word. And this word, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning means well long before Adam. Member of the Godhead. In the beginning was the word, capital W. So the word is a being. And these scriptures that you have are out of the mindset of living beings. Not just a philosophy that men printed on a page, but this is the source of an eternal being who is your creator and your savior and has introduced you to your father. This is bigger than big. So in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was what? Was God. Oh my goodness. And the word became, became one of us. And then he goes over and says, and we've handled him. What are you going to do when you see Jesus one day? You're going you're to peek around the corner and say, oh my goodness, he's too holy for me to look upon. I, I, I guarantee you that if you have a chance in that day when you see Jesus, you're going to want to hold him. Don't come up with all your scriptures to try to remind him who he is. He already knows who he is. He doesn't need you to remind him. So don't come with your catechisms. Come with you. You come and be you. And don't hang your head like a hound dog. Just get up, and that's your husband to be. Get up and look at him and say, whoa. Hi, Jesus. You're going to have that time in the judgment seat of Christ. Every human that said that they declared that salvation was of God, Old and New Testament, will stand before the Lord Jesus and give an account. You will look eye to eye, nose to nose. And he won't be in a confessional box. What are you going to do with him? You're going to cast your eyes down? You got kind of guilt you got. Would you consider that it would be improper to say, Jesus, I, can I, give, can I just give you a hug and say thank you? And is it going to be one of these political hugs? 
If you don't know how, or don't have the, find me a scripture, St. John. Oh, you got a young and you're carrying with there. Find me the scripture that says that John would lay his head on Jesus' chest. Find, I want to read that. I really am strongly sensing as I teach you that God wants you to come to a place of having less plastic in this relationship. Quit looking at God from so far away. He's right here. On the other side of what you can see. What is it? Right, John 13, 23. John 13. I haven't got to James yet, have I? John 13. Lord have mercy. John 13. John 13, John 13. Let's see, that comes after 12, doesn't it? John 13. 13 what? Well, you got it up there already. You're faster than me. This is when Jesus is predicting his betrayal. And uh, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receives whomever I have sent, whoever I send, receives me. He that receives me receives him that sent me. Then Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. That's an offense. You know, Pastor, no, no, I'm right here, aren't I? One, somebody could betray you. Wow. Wow. Then the disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom he spake. And there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, that would be to the one that was leaning on Jesus' bosom, that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. <laughs> poor God, poor Peter. Uh, John, would you ask Jesus who it is? Oh, Jesus is standing right there. And he then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, He it is of whom I shall give a sup when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sup, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sup, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, what you do, do it quickly. Now, I want you to see in this setting, do you think that John had a relationship with Jesus? Can you imagine a grown man hanging around with a grown man and leaning on his chest? You say, whoa. Whoa, that's a little too close for me. I want to tell you something, because the world, because relationships between men can be unclean, does not mean the same thing can be clean in the spirit between brothers. You hold your children, don't you? Do you hold your male children, gentlemen? Oh, you're kidding. Of course you do then what's wrong with holding a brother? He said, but these are grown men. What's that got to do with it? What are you judging things after? Well, I think John should have had a little more respect for Jesus in that setting. Besides, what are all the other guys going to think? What difference is it? Why weren't they leaning their head on? Because they didn't have the same relationship that John had developed with Jesus, but every one of these disciples had an opportunity to do so if they had wanted to. True or false? 